ever struggle with success in any area of your life, stay tuned. We got you covered. I'm Jackie Simmons. I'm the host of the Suicide Prevention Show. And suicide prevention, pure prevention, means we focus on whatever makes your life better, whatever improves your ability to see that you are already successful and to help you go further on that path, no matter what that path is. So to help us fill in this missing link to success, because success was very elusive for me for a really long time. And if it's ever been elusive for you, you're gonna to wanna to hang around. And so here we go. Help me welcome to the studio, the man who did not wait for his cue, but you know, we love him anyway. Here's <laughs> Mitchell Levy. <laughs> Hi, Jackie. How are you, Mitchell? You know, you're gonna give me lots of ways to have a good time for right now. <laughs> yeah. Poking holes at me is a good way and yeah, perfect. So, so nice to see you. Nice to see you too. And just in case you can't tell, Mitchell and I know each other and we got to know each other in a very unique way. Um, and I'm going to let you tell what you remember the story that I'm going to tell what I remember the story. And then we're going to get into what's so good about success in general. How does that sound? I, absolutely. I'm more than happy of you going first. Oh, I suspected you would say that, but it's my show, so it's my rules, Mitchell. It is your rules. Batter yeah. up. You're on deck. So we, we met, I thought it was the Marketers Cruise, mm -hmm. um, which was great. And I'm still debating if whether or not it's I want to go this year. Uh, but we met on the Marketers Cruise, and then we re-met. We spoke at least once post-Marketers Cruise. Just sort of a check-in to see what there might be, how we might be able to work together. We had some really nice conversations on the marketer's cruise. I mean, imagine, you know, you're, you're captive on a boat with 435-ish <laughs> people. I mean, there's, I think there's six to 9,000 overall, but 435 of yeah. your peers. We were part of a peer group, there is no doubt. And it was all about marketing. And we had some great conversations. And then the next time we saw each other was in Las Vegas for the TEDx talks. You know, I mean, this was uh, the day that I have very few memories of because it was a lot of adrenaline in that room. Yeah. <laughs> what I do remember, Mitchell, is that you were the lead off speaker. And what the message you shared led to the message that you're gonna share today which is this concept that credibility is the pathway to more success in your life. So we're going to backtrack just a little bit. Before you were Mitchell Libby, the, the guy with the hat, you know, what, what's your story? I mean, nobody gets to a TEDx stage without living a story. That's, that's my belief. I believe that nobody gets there without having lived a story. So what's your story, Mitch? Well, we all have stories. By the way, I, um, I pronounced my last name Levy, just Thank so you, you know. Yeah, that's important. And, uh, you know, I've been in Silicon Valley for 35 years. The last time I worked for a company was Sun Microsystems. So I left in 1997. I was that guy that would go around to... CEOs, VP of operations, I let them know that there's new technology coming around that would let the companies talk directly to their clients or have their subcomponent manufacturers ship their products directly to clients. And Jackie, I was literally walked out of the office of some companies. Uh, so since 1997, I've started 20 companies. I've sat on the board of a NASDAQ firm. Um, for those that remember Comdex, which was the largest IT conference during the dot-com days, I ran four conferences for Comdex. Um, I've created four executive business programs for Silicon Valley organizations. And as a book publisher, which I started the publishing business in 2005, um, as a book publisher, we've published over 750 books. So what got me to where I am on credibility, first, um, been married. Wait, 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 wait. Hold it, hold it, hold it. You gave this great bio and no story. I want to know who you were before you, you decided to leave corporate 
and become an entrepreneur because that is no small leap. And you just no. rushed right over. Oh, that. I just like rushed it. Was it. No okay, so deal. I was curious. You, you, it was you wanted the the deep story. I got it. I, so. I, I want to know what causes change in your world because no one is going to get a greater level of success without having an experience of change. Yeah, you know, it was, if I went back to, uh, I went back to the beginning, uh, the beginning for what I remember is, is mom and dad got divorced when I was nine. And so I never, I never quite, I didn't have a male mentor in my life. And my first real male mentor was my first boss out of B school. And, and he taught me all these really bad ways and rules to live by. And so, so, so wait a minute, we're going to clean this up for people. All right. Your first boss out of B school, assuming B stands for business. Uh huh. Okay. So I would like your permission to pause, interrupt and open up any acronym or jargon. Cause I want everybody to be able to follow the story. So just, I'd like your permission to do that. Please do, of course. All right. So you came out of business school. You had a boss, your first real real male role model since age nine when your role model, your parents divorced, Mitchell. I want to know what's the decision nine-year-old Mitchell made about what that meant? To me, I think the word integrity is the word that sort of comes to mind when I think about who I was. I was the oldest of three children. And I was always the one that, I, I guess for me, it was kind of what is, what is a male, what is dad supposed to be? What is a father supposed to do? Because he, he tried for a couple of years, just not in a way that I thought made sense as a father figure. And so the thing. Okay, I'm going to translate. Yeah. Here's what I'm hearing. Okay. Nine-year-old Mitchell, his parents are divorced. His dad's trying in a way that's confusing. Okay. Because a nine-year-old's not gonna have father figure in their vocabulary. It sounds like nine-year-old Mitchell was confused by how his father was behaving. Okay, we could say that. Okay, that's just, from that place of confusion, your next father figure was a, what you called a uh, boss that taught you some bad things. Well, I'm not sure the next father figure. So mom got remarried ah. twice. The, the one in the middle um, was, uh, we actually don't really talk about him because he was also one that we were confused about, if we're using the confusing word. The third stepfather um, is actually who I call dad. And he was with us until... April of 2020, he passed of uh, brain cancer. Um, and, and that was, that was a really beautiful man, but he entered my life when I was 18. So he had a much more pronounced effect on my siblings than he did on me. And they're both younger than me. Got it. Got it. So now, thank you. Because with that context, we can put everything that's happened since then, why this is important to you, Mitchell. When you talk about integrity, your face lights up. When you talk about credibility, your energy goes up. Now we know why. Nine-year-old Mitchell had a lesson in the absence of both of those. So now yes, we, know why. <laughs> uh, we all have an origin story. We right? all have an origin story. And the reality is that n when you said, you know, this is the one we don't talk about, there are so many of those stories in our lives that we don't talk about. You know, m I didn't realize until this journey that I'm on now that there was a story in my family about one of my aunts who was often sick. And in a hospital, it was only when I was like 
grown and out of the house that the, I found out that she was not physically sick. She was in a mental health hospital. But we didn't talk about it in our family. It was never shared. So I didn't understand that there was even such a thing as a mental illness. It didn't ever enter into my world until much later when I was faced with that whole medical model of mental wellness. You know, it's like there are gaps. There are things we don't talk about. And so I'm a firm believer that you don't need to talk about any of these things until you have figured out how to release the emotion around it because it could be traumatizing otherwise. So we're not going to go poke it into the story that, that your family doesn't talk about. I just wanted to help everyone understand that it's normal for families to have stories they don't talk about. And sometimes there's gold there. But don't go there alone. I don't recommend anybody go on a journey into family story without a guide because you never know what you're going to find. Um, but anyway, so that's my, that's my public service announcement for that. You know, just because somebody's got a story doesn't mean you have to ask them about it. <laughs> so there we go. But thank you, Mitchell, for being willing to share that part of the story. When you were taking and talking on the stage in Vegas, and by the way, your TEDx talk is available up online. So we'll grab that link and we'll give it to, to everybody. We'll make sure they have it so they can go and watch it after the show. Not right now, guys. Stay present. Here we go. Um, but we'll make sure that link is in the show notes. The power of what you've decided to do to sort of course correct the nation, if you will, caught my attention. And that's why I asked if you'd be willing to come on the show and share it. So your decision to course correct the nation, when did that happen? Actually, I'm going, say the, I'm, going say, I'm going to say the course corrections on the world, so it's humanity. Okay. And that happened through, it was towards the end of interviewing 500 thought leaders on what is credibility. So it wasn't what I set out to do. Okay, so start at the beginning. What did you set out to do? So this was... Because um, this is where we met, was you were just starting this interview series. Yes, we were we at had the, the idea. So we'll step back 2017. At the end of 2017, I did my first TED Talk. And it got me thinking about the world in a different way. What is an idea worth spreading? And what I realized is I was, as, as a book publisher, I was serving the wrong audience. At the time, I was serving the audience of people who would write their own books. And what I realized is the audience that I wanted to serve was the busy, successful professional who wanted to actually have the book written for him and was going to use the book to drive more business. So 2018, I, I created a writing school, picked up 10 clients. 2019, I actually went to a friend's location, changed my brand, so went through a branding exercise and came up with a brand, Global Credibility Expert. Two months later, I just woke up with a Napoleon Hill moment. And this was probably, I think this is about six months before you and I met on the Marketer's Cruise. And the Napoleon Hill moment was essentially uh, Napoleon Hill interviewed 500 millionaires and came up with a book, Think You Grow Rich. If Mitchell Levy interviewed 500 thought leaders on credibility, he'd have a book. So the answer is, yes, I have a book, international bestseller in seven countries. Um, uh, yes, I did a TED talk on credibility. Yes, I have a membership community focused on credibility. And what I really got was something a whole lot more. I got a life purpose that I never had before. Right. And, and that life purpose is, is what I recognized is that we have been taught all the, it's the best way to say it. We've been taught so many ways to do things which are not credible. And typically, Jackie, I know you don't like this word. I use the word dubious, which represents 10 components of things which are not credible. We do things every day which are dubious, like show up late, don't come prepared, don't have integrity, do little white lies, uh, fake it till we make it. All those things are, are dubious components. And so 
what, what ended up happening, I think I'll tell you two statistics that came out of the interviews, and that'll get us on two different interesting paths. One statistic was that 4% of everyone I interviewed, 4% of the people I interviewed came late to a live show. So just think about this for a second. You're being interviewed by the global credibility expert on your credibility, and you think it's okay to come after the hour when the show is live. Okay, so that, that was one thing, crazy. I'll just give you one more and we could dive into either. 98% of the people I talked to could not articulate who they served and the pain point they served in 10 words or less without some coaching. So what that meant to me was not that the world is wrong and, and, and Mitch was right. What that meant to me is we've been teaching people ways to do business that have not been as clear cut has not been as credible as they could be. And that I needed to help educate others so that we together can make the world here, Jackie, this is my, this is now my life purpose. And that is before I die. So we can tip the scale between those people in the world that are credible and those that are dubious. Oh, got it. So I'm going to, um, just from a uh, visual point of view, I'm going to invite you to do the after picture where Credibility Nation is, is weighing down the other side so that you have the vision of where you want it to be. Because I'd love to see that scale. Yeah, that's, that's a scale that I would really, really like to see. So you rattled off about six of the components of dubiousness. So I would love to go there first. I just rattle them all off exactly the way you would do it. If you've got that list, I just think that that would be really useful. You can, um, I don't think that people know what dubiousness looks like. True. Adding little white lies into that. Little white lies were the hallmark of so many um, of the actual so many of the coaches that guided my early career when I decided to come into this whole bigger space. And while I'm not coach, they gave me some uh, pathways to follow and things to say and do that hit a nerve within me as though, is this right? Is this really how business gets done? And in their world, it was both right and normal and accepted and successful based on their definition of success. And so this is a conversation that I really want to get some clarity on. What are this, these 10 components? So it's, it's uh, do you want me to give out, there's a couple of different ways to do it. I can give you the words which are dubious or the words which are credible, or I can give you the components overall, which would you prefer to hear? Okay, so I'm going to come back. We said, you said there were 10 components of dubiousness and you rattled off a bunch of them. I want the uh -huh. whole list of 10 components of dubiousness. Got and it. then we can compare and contrast if you've got the components of credibility, because I know we're going to be talking mostly about credibility because that is the missing link. All right, so let's talk about, I'm just going to rattle off all 10. Yep. Selfish, cool. manipulative, hateful, deceitful, narcissistic, rude, inauthentic, dishonest, never wrong, know-it-alls. <laughs> there we go. When you were rattling them off before, you were sharing the, the, the granular pieces of that. So the, the idea of little white lies being part of that. So guys, it's not necessarily big things. It's the little things that erode credibility. Anything that erodes credibility belongs on the dubious side. How's that for a definition? I, I love that. I'm going to cool. give you a new word, if, if, if you don't mind. I, I, I made up mind. some words that came out of the interviews. One of those words is called cred crud. <laughs> <laughs> Things that erode credibility are cred crud. Exactly. I, I got so. it. So, Yay. by the way, I'm so glad you got that. And I'll, I'm going to give you one that many of us do wrong. And that is at the bottom of your web page, if you don't have a proper copyright signal. 
right? If you don't have the co proper copyright, or let's say it's currently 2021 and your copyright says 2016, or even if you're a publisher and it says 2020, right? If you don't take care of your own personal maintenance of copyright. So that's a minor thing for me, but there are many things that people do, which are small erosions of your credibility, i.e. cred crud. And we don't even know. You know, we don't even know. As a matter of fact, in business school, I don't recall getting the memo that said December 31st, every year, change all of your copyrights on all of your web pages and all of your landing pages. I didn't get that memo. <laughs> no, you know? no, that wasn't handed out. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is unintentional cred cred because it, it does bring down your credibility if you're not managing the details of your business well. And I'm guilty of it. So nobody go looking at my landing pages because now we're going to have to go clean all of that up. I mean, it's only June. I'm good, right? You know, I'm getting it done in the first half of the year. We're going we're gonna to call that semi-cred. So, okay. so, so Jackie, I'll, I'll just give you something so that, that could drill this home. So when you go to the dentist and you have plaque on your teeth, you're not guaranteed that you're going to have a cavity. However, the more plaque you put on, the better chance of a cavity, the more cred crud you have, the more chance of you looking dubious. There we go. It's, um, you know, and I'm going to flip it because I think that what it means is the last chance you have of looking credible. So cool. All right. Now we know what cred crud is. We know how to cure one piece of it, scrape some of the plaque off of our uh, branding teeth, if you will, because we all have a brand, whether we have a business or not. We have what people say about us when we're not around. That's my definition of a brand. So everyone, whether they have a website or not, can look for these things where where are you like not keeping up to date with what you're putting out in the world? And we all put things out in the world just by showing up. All right, take us on to the other side of the coin. Let's go build some credibility. Now that we've dealt with our cred crud or one piece of it, I'm sure you've got a list of that too. I have a list of 10 items. I'll tell you the, the things to be thinking about first, if I'm gonna give you two, and it's sort of the beginning and the end. It's being a servant leader and being coachable. But let me read you off the 10. Selfless, benevolent, loving, virtuous, generous, revered, authentic, honorable, vulnerable, lifelong learners. Cool. And the top two of that was servant leader and coachable. I would say the, the, it's one in 10. Servant leader being selfish uh, is, is one of the most important things you could do is to be of service to others. And the second most important is recognizing that no matter who you interact with, no matter who you work with, no matter where you are, there's always an opportunity to be coached and to learn. Always an opportunity to be learned and be coached, got it. Okay, so that's really interesting to me because I was wondering, I didn't hear servant leader when you read the list, but servant leader falls under the heading of selfless. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. You had asked for specific words that, that talk about what we're focused on. That bring, selfless is, by definition, the word that best represents servant leadership. Um, but I do have another, another list. When, when I look at credibility, the best way, if we're looking at it at a high level, it's the quality in which people know, like, and trust you. And by know, it's not that they know of you. It's that they know you. And if they know you, then what's appropriate is they actually know, and I'll, I'll do it, I'll do, the, I'll do the, the list in the middle that we didn't talk about yet. They know you're under being known. They know your, your demonstrated desire to serve others. They understand your intent and your commitment to do the right thing, and they understand your integrity. So you've shared your integrity. So those are four components under, under the, the credibility pillar known as known under being liked or under likable, there are two. It's sharing your stage and it's showing respect by showing up when you show up. 
And under trustworthy, um, there was, when I did my first TED Talk, I really thought there was only three components of trustworthy, but the interviews helped me remember there was, or helped me understand there was a fourth. So it is showing up as your authentic self, demonstrating integrity in all you say and do, showing your vulnerability, and then being coachable in every situation. And those are the 10 components that came out of the interviews. Got it. So that's really important. And I love the way that you have organized those thoughts. The reality of credibility is that we are often not given good guidance on what it means. You know, in the days of Abraham Lincoln, it was simply be honest. And now we're in the age of social media where the message is hide behind what people expect. And those are two very different messages on what it is to interact with the world. So we've got kind of this, um, I'm not going to call it an uphill battle, but that's what it feels like. Because there's a whole messaging going on that says it's not safe to be vulnerable and that we've got this desire to be known. And there's a mutually exclusive thing. The only way to be known is to allow people to see inside you a little bit. And that was my lesson from taking my TEDx stage and giving my talk. I had a coach at the beginning of my journey who said, you know, my first script was tactical and not vulnerable. So he got me to vulnerable and then COVID closed the stage and I just put that script in a drawer. And then when we got the date for the stage in January of 2021, I pulled that script out, got given a new coach. And the more we worked on my script, Mitchell, the more I hated it. Mm. And finally, three weeks before stage, I got permission to rewrite my script. And I got a coach who said the truth to me. One, he said, my script was good. It was really good content, but it would not inspire anyone. And I went, oops. Yeah, it doesn't really inspire me. So I got help. I got the best coach that I could find, a former TEDx organizer, to walk me through tearing this down and rebuilding it. And we rebuilt it based on a story that I swore I would never tell. And he said, Jackie, you're going to have to. You're going to have to go from being vulnerable, talking about your daughter's suicide attempt, to being naked and taking us to the day of your daughter's attempt. And it was what happened after that that changed me. There is so much power in what you're describing, Mitchell, that it's, it's a journey that is worth doing and not to be undertaken alone. Get some people on your side, people. This is a place where you want expert guidance, in my opinion, because the more you uncover what's not credible, in how you have lived up to this point, the more you are going to need some guidance in how not to get stuck in what wasn't right. Jackie, so that's I, my question for you. How did you resolve that? Oh crap, I've been dubious because I don't think you've been perfect your whole life. I could be wrong, Mitchell. Could be no, wrong. no, that's not possible for any. Well, technically we are all born intersect. We are, we are born neither credible nor dubious. And, and so what happens is as we learn, as we grow, we're taught to be. And it's, it's as you said, it's the people who are trying to be good and share information with us. They're sharing with you, if you're listening or watching, they're sharing with you what has worked for them in the past. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean on a scale of is it credible or dubious that it isn't dubious, right? So first of all, your TED Talk was spectacular. So congratulations on that, because from the first moment you opened your mouth, it was powerful, it was captivating, and it was hard not to listen and pay attention to. And that's what, that's what you want. That's an idea worth spreading is 
holy shit, this is amazing. I have to watch this. And you did. And do I want to take action? Uh, hey, I'm even here right now. And we're still friends and we're still working together. Yes, I definitely want to take action. What you said something else, which was interesting. I am going to answer your question, by the way, but mm -hmm. there's something else that you said you were interesting. Go through it with somebody else. A lot of times you actually have to go through it with somebody else because it's hard for you to see things yourself. And here's what's really interesting. So here's, here's a mic drop for you. Your superpower today, typically, remember I said 98% of people cannot articulate who they serve and the pain point they address. What I typically have unraveled is somebody's superpower, who they are and what they love doing and, and how they show up in the world in such a way that in five words or less, they can articulate something that is memorable and shareable. Typically that comes from a, pace of, a place of pain in the past. It's something that's hurt you in the past. It's some, it's some origin story that you need to unravel so that you can then see why you want to deliver value in who you are and what you do. You then can see why for you personally, it's what lights you up when you, when you actually talk. And to, so the, another word that I use, it's customer point of pain, I call it CPOP customer point of pain. And typically what happens is, and this is the first question that I ask is, is part of the interviews is what is your CPOP? What is your customer point of pain? And 98% of people need to need help on that. Even those people who come in with a beautiful set of five words or six words, because they have a marketing mindset and they know they, they feel like they know what to say. If when they talk about it, it doesn't, it doesn't come from here. It doesn't come from their heart. It's easy to see that they need to update that, that they need to focus on what's important. So, so what happened to me, I, it was towards the end of the interviews when I have something in the order of 459 video testimonials where people are saying things like, Mitchell, I've been looking for clarity for the last two, four, 10, 12 years, and you gave it to me in five minutes. And thank you. So for a little bit of time, maybe actually of the 12 months, probably for nine of those, eight to nine of those, I was letting the ego take over. Like, hey, I'm really good. I know how to solve this issue. And that's a lesson. That's a, that's a, dubious lesson I was taught from my first mentor out of business school. And what happened is I started recognizing that what I was doing is something that's teachable. That it's because one of the things that happened is when people say I, I help get them get clarity in five minutes, it wasn't really five minutes together um, because they spent time with me before we were five minutes minutes together. They, there was a 16 minute video on, on how to prepare for the interviews. There was other interviews they could look at. So they spent time with me in an asynchronous way when I was not with them learning about what to say. And then it was our synchronous, our one-on-one -on -one time together. That was, it was easy to come up with that. And, and it was somewhere in there, somewhere around month eight or nine ish that I kind of looked at this and go, Oh, there's fundamentally a bigger problem that I need to address than having a book or having a TED talk or, or, or whatever it is, you know, that the fundamental issue is that we as society has, have continued to push, let's, we'll go back to the little white lies since they seem to work for you in terms of work. We have been continue to push little white lies and they've gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And we think that's okay. And the little white lies that spew out of people's mouths these days are so much more common than they were 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So the title of my TED talk is we are losing our humanity and I'm tired of sitting around and watching it. And that title came about with my sort of massive aha moment when I recognized that why I was on this earth, why my purpose is something bolder than just creating yet another company that made money. So what's your purpose? It's to tip the scales between those people, uh, in your words, tip the scales towards credibility. 
Why? Comes back to the same, the, it comes back to having integrity. It's having the elements of credibility so that it, there's something so powerful about two humans when they meet and interact and grow from each other. There's nothing more beautiful than that. And there are people who have gone through their lives without ever having done that. And by being credible, it is easier to do. Why? Um, for the bigger why, it's so that our children and their children can live a, a better, more healthy, more humane life okay, than we've lived so ourselves. Now I'm going to pull you back just a minute. What's your CPOP? The bigger, the I've got two at the moment that I'm using. Um, one is overarching, which is what came out of the interviews. It's humans that want to be seen as credible. Okay. And then specifically, I'll give you the second one. This, the second one, which is part of what I have a membership community actually called Credibility Nation. And the, the CPOP that I created for uh, Credibility Nation is small businesses that feel invisible. Okay. So now I understand the feel invisible I get. The first one, I'd love for you to say again, because I've got a question. The uh, overarching. Right. Uh, humans that want to be credible. What's the pain? What's, what's the, the pain of wanting to be credible? Because I'm going, Humans that want to be credible, so that what? You know, or it's, what's the problem with not being? Ah, yeah, see, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really to, trying you. to get a hear because I, this, I, this whole struggle with credibility. I mean, when I was running my business for the purposes of running a business, for helping people do what I had been trained to do with all of the business coaching I had, managing their stress so that they could make more money. That's what I did. You know, helped women entrepreneurs wrap businesses around what they were good at and, and this whole managing the stresses of that, the belief systems that need to be in place. That's what I did for years. And I didn't find the credibility that I could stand on in that realm ever, even though I'm 30 years as a stress management consultant and business consultant. It eluded me. And it inhibited my success, which is why I said, I absolutely believe that this is the missing link to success because the one place that I have credibility, the one place that I could stand unassailable was being the mother of a daughter who at 14 thought dying was better than living. Mm. That's where I have credibility. That is the story I have lived to my daughter's credit, she's the one who broke the silence. My daughter, Stephanie, shared her story in a public way and broke 23 years of us not talking about it. The biggest eroder of my credibility in any area was that secret, that one thing that I would not talk about. And I didn't realize, Mitchell, that that put a barrier between me and the world People didn't know why they didn't want to work with me or didn't, you know, it all made sense to the left brain. But there was an inauthenticity that was in the relationship because I had a secret. There was a little bit of cred cred there or a lot of bit of cred cred that just it, emanated and spewed out uh, everywhere. Agreed. It, it, it impacted every area of my life and I didn't know. And that's what the power of this conversation is. Cred crud exists and it can be invisible. And the ability to become more credible, to trust yourself that this is what you know, gut level know is true about you. And that's made all the difference in my world. And since that TEDx stage, what's changed is everything to the point that now we have law 
launched the Teen Talks program, and we are working directly with teens to help them suicide-proof their friends. And this is not language that I could have used six months ago. By the way, you, you are so, you're spot on. When somebody has their, their CPOP, when you really are credible to yourself, because you have to be credible internally before you can be credible externally. And when you're credible to yourself and truly living that, there's a glow about you. It, the transformation that happens to the people who have been given actually have allowed themselves to unlock <laughs> their, their, that, that customer point of pain. And by the way, I use the word CPOP. It could be customer point of pain, could be customer point of pleasure. It could be credibility proposition. So it doesn't need to have a, so like the marketing speak, is saying, this is a problem, fix it this way. There's, I've seen many scenarios where it does, uh, my particular CPOP is both a pain point and an aspiration point. And I'm, God. it's, I've thought about this a lot. And, and there are just some cases where, where it's most relevant is when it's very close to home and when you say what a CPOP is, it really negatively affects the person it's for. What you want to be able to do then is share a, a actual aspiration point, right? Okay. Because then it's, people, as, as you mentioned, you wanted the scale to be pointing, you know, in a way in which credibility is more heavily weighted. And, and, I, and I, I went through my mind, yes, I do, but I want people to see the scale right now and be offended. Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing I could say. I, let me just go back to 4% of people thought it was okay to come after the hour for a live show to talk about their credibility. Like I, I put my hands in the air and go, really? Like that's, and it still happens. It's crazy. Well, yeah, it's because they don't understand the connection between being on time and credibility. There's a disconnect. And what are the components of credibility? So let's go to what are the components of credibility? One of them is show up when you say you're going to show up. Well, I, I, there's two components under the likable, under the likable pillar. So remember, it's mm -hmm. no like trust. And under likable, there are two components that are really powerful. One is sharing your stage. And we yeah. come back to that. That's, that's a term I, I created called cred dust. We'll come back to that. You're doing that right now, by the way. And the, the, the second is showing respect by showing up when you show up. And so what I, what I suggest you think about by showing up when you show up is there are three things I was thinking about. Come early, come prepared, come with your heart. There so, we go. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. It was, it's still fascinating to me when I look at the numbers in aggregate that when people first entered the green room before we hit the record button and we started the conversation, that only 50% of the people who entered the green room actually were showing me who they were. They were, they were trying to show me a pre pretend version of who they think they were based on what everyone told them they should be versus actually showing me their heart. So, so, yeah, well, we're not taught to show our hearts. I mean, you're talking exactly. about a skill set that is, let me guess, you went to business school. What was the course labeled that taught you how to show your heart? Uh, we don't, there was none of those. There, <laughs> there was, it just, it, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, yeah. You, you've hit upon a huge need in the marketplace for this education that's not in business school, but that matters in business. My inability to show my heart is what held me back in my business for 30 years, people. 30 years, not knowing why I was struggling. I tried different marketing campaigns. I tried different business structures. I tried different course structures. I tried one-on-one -on -one work and group work and community. I mean, I was always looking for the solution without ever understanding that the problem was that nobody told me I was going to have to show my heart. So you've now, you've now hit the nail on the head because there's every, all, your, all these experts are out there 
sharing with you a solution that has worked for some subset of their client base. Yeah, work and for them. Quite, or and work. it's quite possible that you could find a solution and it'll work for you, right? It just, yeah. however, Jackie, you're spot on. If you're not approaching it and opening up your heart and sharing who you are, you, you, once you do that, once you figure this out, once you know, and by the way, it doesn't mean on a CPOP, it doesn't mean it doesn't change. Your customer point of pain will change over time as you learn, as you grow, as you shift the audience that you want to serve. But until you do that, nobody's solution is going to be long-term helpful to you. Because what's going to be helpful for you is for you to get to know yourself first, to figure out who it is that, that A, you, that you love yourself, and that you can then share that love, share that heart with others. And you're doing it in such a way that goes back to, it actually goes back to that thing from the beginning, goes back to your origin story. How do you want to show up? How do you want to serve? How do you want people to see you? How do you want to add value? There you go. Cool. All right. So let's bring this up to where we can put a nice pretty bow on it for everybody in a few minutes. And we're going to talk about your gift for everybody because it's amazing. And so we're going to get that where everybody understands. But you brought up something you said you'd get back to. And that was cred dust and sharing the stage. So let's go. And don't Thank worry, you. we got all your links. We got you covered. Oh, good. good. I was just looking for my No, links. no, no. That's not your job. Put those glasses <laughs> hey, away. You know, I knew you got distracted. Did, You're like, did uh -uh. you see, I, I, I put on my glasses. Oh, man, I need my link. So thank you. <laughs> no, no, no. We got you back on this. Katie's Thanks for reading between the lines. Yeah. You know, it was really interesting. I was talking with David Meerman Scott. David is the, the gentleman that created the word called newsjacking which was essentially when there's something going on in the news, see if you could tie what you're doing associated with what's happening in the news and you'll be part of the news story as well. Um, David is the guy who, who actually, when Tony Robbins has a, a two day event, uh, David will get two hours on stage, right? It's just one of those things that happens. So I'm talking to David and I said, you know, how do I get this credibility thing out there and what do I need to do? And his response was, Mitchell, invent a word. And I go, oh, okay, cred dust. He goes, no, 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 Mitchell, it took me about six months to, to actually make this happen. You, you could take a little bit longer. I said, no, no, it's cred dust. I don't know if it's 1D or 2. I, by the way, I ended up going with 1. And if you want to see the definition, I, we probably didn't share this as a link, creddust.com, you could actually see the definition. What happened was I was just thinking about all the thought leaders I spoke with who were successful and what did they often do? Well, they had that servant leader attitude, which was part of the being known pillar. And they would always talk about other people first. They would always say, Oh, do you realize that Jackie Simmons in terms of how she learned how to do her Ted talk and show her, vulnerability. She did a phenomenal job. And it is, once you watch it once, you can't forget it. You should watch Jackie's talk. That's me spreading cred dust. It's when you share somebody else's ideas, thoughts, or actions. Because just so you know, we've been taught wrong. We've been taught we should only talk about us, right? We shouldn't talk about other people because we don't want to mention our competitors because then people might go there. And, and, you know, Miracle on 34th Street with Santa Cross and Chris Kringle, when you actually do share other people's ideas, other people's thoughts, if you're, the, if, if you're that magnet, you're that compass that's focused on what you do and you do it well, and you want to bring in as many other people who can support you, whether or not they're direct competitors or not, you need to do that. Because what you should care most about is that your audience you serve is served, whether you do it to somebody else. And if you can do that, people end up coming back to you for the bigger picture, for more things. And, and so cred dust is really that magic that happens for everyone when you share somebody else's ideas, thoughts, or actions. So I'm gonna um, pop this back one piece because you brought up something um, as an example, which was some aspect of Miracle on 34th Street. 
And you're going to have to tell me which scene on Miracle on 34th Street supports this because I got I got hooked there running the movie in my mind. I suspect <laughs> somebody else got hooked out of the room as well. So let's bring them back. It's, in Miracle on 34th Street, when what happened? It was interesting. It was, oh God, I can't remember the character's name. So I apologize for anyone who's who's thinking it's, I don't know enough, but it's- No, that's okay. We'll talk about them. It's I'm, when I'm, Macy's goes to the, the store, the store manager and says, what an amazing- thing is happening right and there was even headlines in the newspaper macy's right. does this great thing by sending people to their to, to kimball's their competitors to, to where their competitors they actually get served so they can get served and it was it was i guess the visual was that and and the auditory was yeah i don't know why he's doing that because at first he was almost fired for sending people to the competitors Oh, yeah. I, that was a great scene where Santa says, we've got skates and they're very good skates, but they're not good enough. And, <laughs> Thank you <yeah>. for that. <laughs> um, and, and so, yeah. And, and the kid with the fire who wanted the fire truck. I mean, I, I watched the original Miracle on 34th Street. So the kid who wanted the fire truck and I'll only squirt the water outside, never in the house. And the mom is like, yeah, I want to talk to Santa, too because Santa said he would get the fire truck. And she's like, Macy's doesn't have it. Nobody has it. And Santa says, keep track of these things. You know, you go to this store, they have it. And she went, wow, I never thought I'd see the day. Yeah. She says, I've never been a Macy's customer much before. This is how it spread was that she's the one who said to the, the manager, now that I'm remembering it, I've never shopped much, much at Macy's before but i'm going to shop here all the time now after i get this fire truck yeah it, it was it was the power of cred dust is beautifully illustrated in that scene of the the two kids that that santa sends the kids the parents somewhere else to buy the gift yeah. i'm going to google that i'm going to go to youtube and see if i can find that scene now that now that you brought it up visually thank you <laughs> well, you're, you're very welcome. Like I said, I had to know which scene it was because I love the movie and, and I couldn't come up with which one was cred dust, but oh my God, what a beautiful example of the, as Katie put in the chat, thank you, Katie, they became known as the people store from mm. that. Yeah, they, they actually, Macy's and Gimbel shook hands. You know, they, they, they became friendly. They, and it was a huge, huge shift in that competitive, uh, vicious kind of environment that shifted because of cred dust. So now we know the power of cred dust. You know, who knew? You know, miracles happen. We have a proof of it in multiple versions of that movie. Uh -huh. Yeah. Love that. So, so yeah, don't Google it while you're talking to me. All right. <laughs> show up when notes. you show up, Mitchell. Mitchell. Mitchell, actually, take notes. Make sure you Google that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. Katie's got your back on that. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Um, yeah. <laughs> I realized as you were talking, I got an idea for, and, and I know we're going to have to wind this up, but I got an idea for your CPOP. What if it's customer point of potential? Hmm. So, that's just one more random thought from the library in Jackie's head. Ooh. And in the meantime, hey, Mitchell, if there's one thing you want the world to know about how credibility will link them up to the success that they envision for themselves, give me one sentence. I'm so stuck on what you just said. I think I'm going to have to incorporate that. If you want to live your full potential in life, live it credibly. Ooh, beautiful. I love that. Mitchell, thank you so very much for coming on the show and sharing your journey into this world of credibility. Thank you. Oh, Jackie, my pleasure. Uh, it's always fun to talk to you. It's even more fun to talk live <laughs> when you're spreading cred dust. So thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm going to say final word on this is everybody go spread some cred dust. And the final word is Mitchell's. <laughs> 
Listen, have fun, enjoy yourself, spread some cred dust. Thank you.